sorry, I'm having just thought of putting the uh, recording on. So there he was standing, Caesar Augustus, seeing all these soldiers march in front of him after they had won a battle, taken over another country, subjected other kings and countries to themselves, that they would pay tribute to Rome. Rome became more and more powerful. So what you are seeing there really is a victorious army. Let's put it in other words, a triumphal entry. You know those words, don't you? You've heard them in the New Testament about when Jesus walked into Jerusalem. That's what's happening there in a worldly sense. A triumphal entry into Rome of the victorious army. And so I called it victorious army today because I think it's absolutely vital that we realize that we are in an army. We're in a battle. We're in a war. And we know that our struggle is not against flesh and blood but it is against the rulers and against the powers and the authority and the powers of this dark world. And also against spiritual forces in heavenly places. That beloved is the battle that you are in. Whether you know it or don't know it, that's the battle that began when Cain killed Abel. The war has continued from that time until today. The war has always been there. In a worldly sense, countries are at war virtually all the time, permanently. If it's not one country, it's another. And today it's in almost every country. If there's not wars against another country, they're warring against themselves. People rebelling against their rulers and there's just unrest and war and lack of peace throughout the world that's the world that we're living in now but that's in the human sense what about the spiritual war what about the war that i spoke about which is against the rulers and against the authorities and against the the um the powers of this dark world and rulers the powers in this dark world speak of a spiritual force that is at war with every one of us. You are in that war, whether you know it or not. If you don't know that you're in a war, then maybe we need to be more in prayer to become more spiritually aware of what's going on in the spirit world where Satan is doing his best to divide brother against brother, sister against sister, children against their parents, parents against their children, country against country, church against church. Satan's at work. And that's what we talk about when we speak about the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. That's the war we are involved in. And I want to make a statement here today, whether you know it or know it, don't know it, that there's a winner to that war and it's already conclusive. It's already been settled. Jesus is the winner of that war. Amen. Jesus is the winner of that war. And if you are a born again Christian, then you are in the winning army. Hallelujah. You're in the winning side. That's what we are so grateful about. Let us read some scriptures today from 2 Corinthians. We'll be reading from chapter 2 uh, of the second letter of Corinthians. And we'll be reading from verses 14 to 17. For those that want to look it up in your own Bible, you're welcome to do so. I'm going to be reading it in the New International Version. Let's begin. But thanks. Be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. 
Christ leading us. In that triumphal procession that through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of Jesus. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are the smell of death. To the other, the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a cost? Amazing verse of scripture. But we are to God the aroma of Christ. And we are to the world the aroma of Christ. And to some in the world that, that sense that aroma coming from Christians, it spells death to them because they have resisted Jesus. They want to know nothing about Jesus. And so when you say Jesus is the way to heaven, is the only way to heaven, that spells death to them. You smell like death to them. No wonder the world hates us. But to those who have a heart for God, you are the aroma of Christ, which is the smell of life. Hallelujah. We are the smell of life. Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity, like men and women sent from God. Like men and women sent from God. Like men and women sent from God. Later on, you'll see why I've emphasized that a few times. But right now, let's get into what I really wanted us to talk about this morning. And we'll start with the triumphal procession. The most outstanding triumphal procession that has ever been was not Augustus Caesar or Julius Caesar or any other powers of the world that might be. And their triumphal processions as their army came before them was nothing compared to the greatest triumphal procession that has ever been. And that was the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Amen? That's Jesus' entry into heaven. Now the question is, and I want to focus on this for a second. Who was Jesus when he came in? What was his status? Was he the king? Or was he the sacrificial lamb? Walking into Jerusalem. Who was he? He was both. He was the king of kings, the lord of lords. But he was also the sacrificial lamb. None of the people knew that. Not one of those people who laid down their palm branches or their jackets for him to go over shouting hallelujah, hosanna, whatever they did, none of them, not even the disciples understood that within a few days, Jesus would be the lamb, the sacrificial lamb. There on the hillside, when Jesus was born, there were shepherds looking after the sheep and they were preparing the lambs for the Passover. And that's exactly what happened when Jesus had that triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Out on the hills around Jerusalem were shepherds looking after their flocks and they were getting the lambs ready that were to be sacrificed that very week. Nobody knew but the last sacrifice that ever needed to be done was going to be done by the king who was also the sacrificial lamb. Wow. Man, I just feel the presence of God as I speak about that. 
that Jesus was both the king and the sacrificial lamb as he walked in there. The king because he was God the creator. The sacrificial lamb because he was about to die. The Muslims are mine. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi, wise men from the east, came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who had been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Confirmation from the birth of Jesus that he was the King of the Jews. In fact, the King of Kings. And these Magi had been told by whom, we don't know. Possibly an angel, maybe just by a revelation of, from God, that the king of the Jews was about to be born. And they came from a long way away in the east. And so they must have had this message. And for a long time they were traveling, maybe months, to get to Jerusalem. Why? Because the king was born. Now that king is marching into Jerusalem to lay down his life for you and I. John chapter 1 verse 29. The next day John the baptizer saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so Jesus was every bit as much King as he was lamb, the lamb of God, the one who went to the slaughter without any fighting at all, without any resistance. He went into Jerusalem. Before this, on one occasion, I remember in the scriptures it says that Jesus set his face like a flint towards Jerusalem. He knew what he was going to and he went anyway. Most of us would have resisted if you know you're going to get into trouble when you go somewhere. You avoid going there. Not Jesus. He knew he was going to be abused, beaten, killed. And it was all because of his love. For God so loved you. For God so loved you and I. That's who Jesus was when he went in there. Both king, but the people when he was born were told about the Magi from the east. They were told he was king, but also the lamb, as John the baptizer said. When he was baptizing the people, that Jesus was about to come and be baptized himself, and even before that, he said, Look, the lamb. The Lamb of God, who does what? Takes away the sin of the world. You and I. What a triumphal procession when you think of it in those terms. Jesus walking in to that city as king, exalted by people, but also as the Lamb. Going without complaint. So we see in Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, we read, He leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. That's what we read. What is, what is Paul saying to us? That Jesus walked in in triumphal procession, and all the people that were present saw that and understood that this was a great occasion. But what about you and I? Paul says that we were there. We were part of that triumphal procession. He leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. So we are part of that triumphal procession. You see, in Rome, after a conquest, the general would rule, would, would lead the people. Before
before the emperor. And they would regard that as a triumphal procession. But when Jesus walked into Jerusalem, there was a different wall. This was not a wall for territory. This was not a wall for gold or for possessions like Caesar would attack countries that were wealthy. This was a different kind of war. This procession, this victorious procession, was victory of good or the evil, because that's the war. That's what Jesus was doing. We know the winner of that war is Jesus. Good is victorious and always wins over evil. But you might see on the screen right now that comment, but evil doesn't know that. People don't understand that. Just as I said that when they when Jesus walked into Jerusalem, they did not know that he was going to take away the sins of the world. He was going to pay a price that would make it possible for you and I and all the world, if they wanted to, to be saved. The people didn't know what Jesus was doing. They could never understand it. But I dare to say today that people in the world still don't understand it. What Jesus was walking into Jerusalem for. What did he go and do there? The only way you know that, and I know it, is because we have been born again. You see, that's when the mind change comes. Would you think of, of Nicodemus when he came to Jesus? You see, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. What was Nicodemus coming to Jesus for? I mean, he was a Pharisee. He understood the law. He understood that the Pharisees tried to obey the law and be good people. And so he came to Jesus. He said, Jesus, what's this all about? I see your teachings are different. That's basically what he said to Jesus. Your teachings are different. You're teaching from heaven. We see that you've been sent from heaven and you're giving us a teaching different to that we've learned from our from our professors at Bible school. Different from the leaders of today. What are you trying to tell us? We couldn't understand it, you see. Can you see Nicholas in the Demas and put yourself into that position before you were saved? You'd look at Christians and say, these guys are mad. What are they saying that there's only one way to heaven? Surely all religions are open to going to heaven. That's what all the leaders of the world say. That's what most of the, or many of the churches are saying today. There are many churches that are trying to get into ecumenical movements where they say, we we'll all worship the same God in different ways. That's calling Jesus a liar. That's what it's doing. Because Jesus said, I'm the only way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. There's no life without Jesus. There's no truth without Jesus. There's no way to heaven without Jesus. There is only one name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Jesus. Nicodemus, you must be born again. Did you know how many of your friends, your neighbors, your family members, close or extended, are on a different road and are blind to the fact that this procession, this triumphal procession, was meant to include them, for God so loved the world. The whole world would have accepted Jesus as he came into Jerusalem. Many put their palm branches down, but many did not. And here we have it today. The majority still don't believe in Jesus. 
on a terrible thing. Salvation is still here in its previous stages with many of us. Because you see, salvation is the beginning of the work, not the end of the work. Salvation is the passport into heaven, but it's not when God takes you into heaven. If it was, we'd all get saved and raptured immediately into heaven. But God left us here because there's a walk. There's a, there's a purpose. There's a life after salvation. Well, it's a different life. It's the real life. The life of Jesus. But I want to say something that I'll put up on the screen as well. That the enemy will never stop. He wants us to fail. He wants to divide us. His purpose is to kill and steal and destroy. That's what the evil one wants to do. And he will keep on doing it. The battle is continuous. He's continually trying to stab you in the back. Continually trying to draw you away from God. And put you on a wrong path. The battle will never stop. So we then must fight. This fight that I spoke about evil. This fight of the forces of evil in the heavenly realms and to fight against that continually. Do we do that? How is it going to happen? Well, point number two, the aroma of Christ. That's who we are. Exodus chapter 29 and verse 18 says, then burn the entire ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord, a pleasing aroma and offering made to the Lord by fire. And you'll see some other verses up on the screen which virtually say the same thing. It's by fire. This is an offering that was made for sin. You see, none of, none of them except the prophets understood that one day God would bring a sacrifice to end all sacrifices. So the thinking was that every time they sinned, they needed to sacrifice. And tomorrow if they sinned, they needed to sacrifice again. And so every, every period of periodic, periodic time, they would have to come along and do a sacrifice for their sins. It's almost like some who believe that you go to confession on one day and then next day or the next week you can do anything you like and you go to confession again. And so you do it again and again. You see where it comes from. It's an Old Testament principle that you can confess and do some penances and, 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 and then you're okay with God for the short while. It's a temporary thing. And the sacrifices in the Old Testament the testament were exactly the same. Those, those sacrifices were basically confessing to God your sin and, and giving a penance of some sort by paying for an animal of some sort and giving that animal a dove or the sheep or, or, or the goat or whatever as a sacrifice for your sins. Ongoing. Because it was only temporary. You had to do it again and again. And that's what confession to man is like. You have to do it again and again because you sin again and again. And so it's an ongoing thing. So why then sacrifice by fire? In what way is this a sweet smelling aroma to God? Is it because God likes the smell of a bride? You know that you like the smell of it, right? When your neighbor's brying, it makes you, your, your mouth water. You say, maybe we should have a bride too. 
face it, we like the smell of a bride. Is that what it's all about? That God likes the smell of a bride? Is that why Paul says the aroma is a pleasing offering to the Lord? Or does it have a deeper meaning? You see, for that animal to be killed, there was blood involved. Blood to be sprinkled on the altar. Once a year, the blood of a lamb without blemish had to be taken and sprinkled upon the mercy seat for the sins of the priest and the sins of all the people. The blood. When God smells the sweet aroma, of a Christian is because of the blood of Jesus, his precious son, who has cleansed you from all sin. And that aroma of having been cleansed, the aroma of righteousness, the aroma of new life, is a pleasing aroma to God. And when he said in the Old Testament that the sacrifice was a an aroma pleasing to God. It was an aroma that God was, it was a foreshadowing of Jesus' sacrifice for you and I. That's the aroma that God could smell. The aroma of the church, the aroma of born again Christians, the sweet smelling aroma to God. That's why Paul says, that what you are. You are the aroma of Christ to God. And you are the aroma of Christ to the unsaved. And you are the aroma of Christ to those who are being saved. <laughs> it's very savor to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. But you see, one of the things about the sacrifices of the Old Testament, as I said before, it was almost like a, a confession in the Catholic Church. You've got to go again and again and again and again, sacrifice after sacrifice. If Jesus did it. The Bible uses some words once for all. Once for all. You see, that Old Testament sacrifice. That was a pleasing aroma to God was because it was a foreshadowing of the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus once for all. See those words on the screen, once for all. I put them up there in bold print because it's so important. Come from Hebrews chapter 7, verse 27. It says, unlike the other high priests, now, this is the writer to the Hebrews, some feel it's Paul, some think it's one of us or someone else, but it doesn't matter who wrote it. He didn't want it to be known who he was, but he said, unlike the other high priests, Jesus does not need to offer sacrifices day by day for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because that's exactly what had to happen with the high priest in the Old Testament. When he took that blood into the Holy of Holies and he sprinkled it on the mercy seat, it said he did it first of all for his own sins and for the sins of the people. And now the writer to Hebrews says, when Jesus sacrificed himself, it was not like that. He was not sacrificing for himself and for the other people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all, when he offered himself, we find some other scriptures which say the same thing. Once for all, that means no other sacrifice is ever needed. There's no penance needed for salvation. Beloved, you are saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. Praise the Lord. As the Roman soldiers um, came victorious into Rome, they were accompanied by a smell. They used to burn 
incense or aromatics, acknowledging the favor of their gods. So here we've got Satan counterfeiting that same principle of the beloved, the, being, the family of God being a sweet smelling aroma to, to, to God. And so Satan tries to, to copy that. And even in the Roman days, he did it. The army would come in with the smell of fragrances to show that they were victorious. And as, a, as an honor and a thanks to their gods, who are not gods at all. For Paul teaches us that we are that sweet smelling aroma to God, our different weapons. So in salvation and our subsequent lifestyle after salvation, we are with God's help, victorious conquerors, hallelujah. With God's help, after salvation, in salvation, we are by faith overcomers. We have overcome the world. We've overcome Satan. We have a passport to heaven. But we continue our lifestyle. And we are expected to continually, with God's help, to be victorious because we're in the winning army. You see, to the unbelievers, we are a skeleton. You see, that's the, the caveat, the exception to the rule of us being victorious conquerors. We must the aroma of Christ, not only to the believers, but to the unbelievers. The smell of the crime against war or the crime against Christians. No wonder you'll find more countries that persecute Christians than any other religion. The awesome persecute Muslims, like for instance in India, where the Prime Minister is now a, a staunch Hindu, and he wants the whole of India to be Hindu. Uh, and they are persecuting not only the, the Christians, but Muslims as well. There are terrible things happening in the world against believers in Jesus. Because you are the spell of death. John chapter 3 verse 18 says this about death. Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's own one and only Son. Know what that is saying. Those people who do not believe in Jesus have condemned themselves. Nobody else has condemned them. They have heard that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish. For God does not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world through him would be saved. But there after the very next verse it says, Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned because he has not believed in God's one and only Son. How sad that is. The terrible truth that some of our loved ones, some of our friends, some of our neighbors are on that. So what then, beloved, should we do about it? Is it our fault that they've chosen to go that way? Is it our responsibility or theirs? They stand condemned already because they have not believed in God's one and only Son. So it's their fault. What are we supposed to do about it? Well, I'll tell you what we're supposed to do. Point number three. We are sent by God. That's who we are. You, you see, some people think that Christianity is about what you do. 
but it's much more about what you are. It's more about your character, more about your holiness, your righteousness, than about the activities that you do. So, so we need to remember that when we talk about being sent by God, you see, some people get the idea that that's what I've got to do as a Christian. I've got to get out and go to some place where they have been. There's one teacher in the Bible said, you, you, you never go to a place to visit their need. That's, that's not what motivates missionaries to go to a place of need. The need is not what should motivate them. The love of God is what should motivate them. Loving God enough to go do something about it with God sends you. We are sent by God. It's who we are, beloved. I'm describing your nature as God sees it. You are sent by God. 2 Corinthians 2.17 says, unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity, like men sent from God. I read that in the beginning. It was the last verse of our reading this morning. We are men and women sent from God. You're sent by God, and you're sent from God. So, as I said when I introduced our talk this morning, we're in an army, we're in a battle, we're in a fight. You're in the army. And if you're a born again Christian, you are sent by God. That's who you are. Matthew 28 18, you know it so well. It says, Then Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now, you know the rest of it, and so your mind is already going on to what I'm going to say in the next verse. But whoa, whoa let's stop it for a moment. What is Jesus saying? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. All authority of the creation has been given to Jesus. Every star is subject to Jesus. Every moon Every, every asteroid, the earth, and all on it is subject to Jesus. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given by the Father to the Son. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. Now, beloved, what does that mean in your life? Do you realize what being a Christian is? That, that when you become a Christian, the Bible says you have been bought by God, purchased by his blood, which makes you a slave. We, we don't like to think of ourselves as slaves in this day of freedom. You know, we're all free to do what we want. Well, God gives his slaves freedom to choose to act as slaves or to rebel. You see, we have a slave driver that doesn't drive. We have an owner who doesn't drive us. But we are slaves. I'm a slave of the Lord Jesus. Jesus modeled that when he came to earth. He considered himself a slave of the Father. He said, I don't do anything on my own. I only do what the Father tells me. Everything I say is what the Father has taught me. Every miracle I do is what I see the Father doing. So we are slaves. And if we are slaves, and the slave owner says, all authority is mine, therefore this is what I want you to do. Now you suddenly realize, but now hang on a second. This scripture is not just for the disciples. It's not just for the pastors, or for the elders. This scripture now 
is being spoken to me personally. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. You are sent by God. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. To obey everything that I taught you, said Jesus. I want you to make disciples, not just converts. I want you to make disciples. Love people enough to give them a tax, and then love them enough to invite them into a, a community of Bible study and Bible teaching, like life of the church. Don't just get somebody saved by giving them a tax. You want to disciple them, bring them into the church, teaching them. Jesus said, if you do that, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. But Jesus said, let's see what Mark says about that same teaching of Jesus. Mark says, says it this way. Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. Jesus. These signs will believe in those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. You know, we focus a little bit sometimes on the picking up snakes with their hands and, and drinking deadly poison. You know when that's going to happen? Maybe when you're in a pit and somebody throws a snake in there because they want to kill you. That's when the, the necessity of that being able to pick up a snake will be given to you by God. He doesn't give it to you to go out and, and practice the art of magic, the sorcerer who's able to drink poison, put swords down your, your throat and, 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 uh, and do all those stupid things. Picking up snakes and playing with them. That's not what it's about. That's not what Jesus is talking about. But listen to what he says in addition to that little bit about the snakes and the poison. He says, you will be able to drive out demons. Do you know what authority and power you have as a child of God bought by, blood, by the blood of Jesus? You have the authority to drive out demons. You have the authority on the, on the basis of scripture, to pray for the sick and they will get well. These are the things that Jesus is offering to the church. And so I have to ask the question, why is it that we don't see all these miracles today? Why are they so few? I don't know what the answer is. Maybe somebody can help me. What do you think? I wonder if it's not because we don't go out and make disciples. I wonder if it's not because the church is not allowing itself to be a witness for Jesus. In my last sermon two weeks ago, I asked the question, when you go to work in the morning, do the people at the office see that you have been with Jesus? Have you been with Jesus every day? Have you been with Jesus this morning? You're with him now. I have no question about that. Jesus is filling us all. I said at the beginning of the service, Lord, we meet in the name of Jesus. Therefore, you are here. But I know that he's here. 
developed this morning. Where you would be this And I'm wondering whether we don't lack some of the, the promises of being able to deal with things, cast our demons, speak in new tongues. I wonder sometimes if it's not connected in some way, not being a disciple. A witness. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Jesus said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will receive what? Power. And you will be my witnesses. He didn't say you will go out and witness. He said, You will be my witness. Once again, I bring you back to what I said in the beginning. Is it what you do? Or what you are. What does God want out of you and I? The purpose is not to bring condemnation on anyone, make you feel guilty. That's not what it's all about. You don't have to do anything but be a witness. That's what Jesus said. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So baptism there. Holy Spirit, as many people think this, this gift of tongues, that's only an evidence, not what it is. It's not being the witness. Being the witness way. Well, the missionary was once asked for a definition of what is a missionary. He said, a person who is sent on a mission. Simple. That's a mission. A person who is sent on a mission. Are we getting true to ourselves today that we are sent? Isn't that what Jesus said? I'm sending you. I'm giving you the Holy Spirit to turn you into what you ought to be. A witness for Jesus. Our mission is now spread and the local and the Kumalanga and South Africa and the even to the other most part of the world. That's our mission field, is what is given to us. But we need to have a mindset that says, yes, Lord, how do you want me personally? To be involved in this mission work. What can I do? And it will be different to be a witness. You know, we sometimes think that we have to have some method of evangelism. Well, one of the most effective evangelists in Vietnam was one once asked, What's your method to get so many people saved on a one to one basis? I'm not talking about a man. Who preaches like Billy Graham and gets a thousand people or two thousand people saved? No, no. A man who one to one on one brings so many people to Jesus that they ask him, "What's your method?" He said, "Well, my first question to them is an important one." Well, what is that first question? He says, "I I have good news for you, but it's going to cost you your life. Do you want to hear it?" In Vietnam, it could cost you your life. When you say that to a Vietnamese, they realize what you're talking about. It's not just an expression. When he says, I've got good news for you, but it may cost you your life, they know that he really means it may cost you your life. Do you want to hear it? And he's getting more people saved than any other evangelist. He's not offering an easy gospel He's telling them like it already is. And you and I think that we, we haven't got the ability to go into the world and say to someone, do you know Jesus? Do you know be a witness. Just be a witness. You see, with the believers in Vietnam, they are so imprisoned and persecuted 
as I put up on the screen, that they're not surprised with the shares that they got to your life. In fact, they expect it. They expect it. So, to bring it to a conclusion, we're in a war. Armor has been provided to us. We're in a war. But our battle is not against rulers or against authorities or against powers of this dark world. It is against the spiritual forces and people and the heavens. And you and I know that we've been clothed. What with the dark of two. You know the scriptures. I won't go through all of them. We've been clothed with the breastplate of righteousness. We've been clothed with our feet, clothed and uh, shod with the gospel of peace. We've been clothed with the shield of faith. We've been armed with the shield of faith. We've been armed with the helmet of salvation. This is the order in which you'll find it in, in the teachings. Chapter 6. And you also have in your hand the sword of God, which is the word of God. So how how do you get all this armor? You know, some people think that every morning you've got to get up and think about it and take it and put it on. You know. Where do you get this armor from? Well, let's go through it. Belt of truth. Here's the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. When I tell the truth, Jesus said, I am the truth. If you want the belt of truth, get Jesus in your life. What about the breastplate of righteousness? Who is the righteous one? The Bible tells us that the, the scepter, which is the symbol of a king, the scepter of the kingdom of Jesus is righteousness. He is our righteousness. You want to be righteous, all you need is Jesus. You want to be clothed with your feet shod in the gospel of peace. Well, who's the prince of peace? Only Jesus. That's all you need is Jesus to have your feet shod in that wonderful gospel of peace. What about the shield of faith? Who's your faith in? In faith? In your church? In your denomination? In your studies? Your faith is in Jesus, the person of Jesus. You want the shield of faith? Jesus in your life. That's all you need. Helmet of salvation? Jesus. Sword of the Spirit? Jesus. John said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word. So for all of that armor, all you need is Jesus. Don't allow condemnation to come upon you. That's not the purpose of me bringing this Word of you must be your sins. It's to, to have Jesus more fully in our lives. That's all it's about. Because when you receive power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. To Jerusalem, all to be Remember the battle. David and Goliath. Goliath was too big. There was no hope for David except that he was to God. That's where his courage came from. That's where his victory came from. So it is with you and I. All those gathered here will know that it is not by the sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's. He will give all of you Philistines into our hands. Is what Jesus did. 
gave it to, to this giant, and to all the Philistine armies. But the battle is not ours. The battle is not mine. And he will do all you Philistines in the night. In other words, let's believe that God is going to add to our number those who are not being saved, those who are being saved. Those who are not saved, those who are needing to be saved. Let's believe that God is going to use you and I as the aroma of Christ out there. 